All right, hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the first video in our last series of videos talking about aggregate supply side policy for unit four area study two. Finally, it is the final path towards ending VC economics, which some of you are probably very excited about and then either continuing economics at university or never thinking about economics again, depending on which camp you are in. On the upside for many of you, this topic is gonna to be super short. There's only gonna be three videos for it as BCAR have cut this topic in half, basically with the um, adjusted study design for 2020. Uh, if you're watching this in another, another year, sucks to be you, there's a little bit extra to go with. So to look at what we're gonna look at today, let's move on to the key knowledge, which is, today we're gonna be looking at this first point over here, which is all about the nature and operation of, and aims of aggregate supply side policies and their relationship to domestic macroeconomic goals, international competitiveness, and living standards. That's going to be it. The next time we're going to look at the relationship between um, the allocation of resources and aggregate supply, kind of like more directly how it impacts the domestic macroeconomic goals, and then lastly, how the government uses those four things to influence aggregate supply. So let's get right into it with the nature, operation, and aims of aggregate supply side policies. So, aggregate supply side policies are all about anything that affects the productivity, efficiency, or cost of production for businesses and allows them to either increase their productive capacity or increase their efficiency so they are producing at a higher rate. So we're gonna look at that specifically, but almost everything that we look at, well, everything we look at, will directly impact businesses and either the quality or quantity of resources available for them to use. Um, so we look at the nature and operation and aims of aggregate supply side policies. We're talking about aggregate supply, which refers to how much producers are willing and able to produce at any given price and time across a whole economy. These AS policies refer to any measure designed to reduce the cost of productions and or improve supply conditions for businesses. So they are the important two things. They are the two things that can help increase our productive capacity and therefore increase our um, aggregate supply overall. And we're gonna look at a number of different things that can help do that along, along with recent examples. We're going to try and do in these PowerPoints a little bit different from some of the previous ones. Is specifically make hints, I guess, along the way about things VCAR likes to ask in regards to this area of study and areas that students often kind of slip up. So the main purpose of aggregate supply side policies is to create the conditions where um, it's going to lead to more favourable situations where businesses are able to lower their cost of production or increase efficiency or productivity to increase their aggregate supply. So this allows for strong growth rates in a way which is sustainable because we are not burning through more of our resources than we need to. Um, this can be measured in a bunch of different ways. Like often one of the um, most common ways that we can look at is GDP per hour worked. Where if we are getting more GDP or more production for each hour worked by employees, that means we're being more efficient. We're using our resources more effectively and that is gonna be really beneficial for our economy. So as you can see in the aggregate supply side diagram there, all about increasing aggregate supply to get that efficient, non-inflationary, sustainable growth. And so by doing any of these policies, so if we're doing things where, say education and training, where um, employees are then more skilled and more able to do their job effectively and they're able to produce more per hour work, that's gonna increase our aggregate supply and move shift to the right there in a favorable direction and mean we're producing more in total, which is better for the economy overall. So it allows for strong growth rates and doing so in a way which is sustainable. So always thinking about aggregate supply side policies that are trying to shift that aggregate supply side curve to the right, which is favorable. So Australia has a long, long history of relying on the exports of commodities and raw resources to fuel our growth. For a long period of time, we were um, exporting our iron ore, exporting coal, um, et cetera, which to be really like bluntly honest about it, like we have a limited amount of those left. Unless we magically find more areas to mine, um, which is problematic in itself, it's a limited um, source of income and revenue for Australia. And therefore, as that's starting to slow down, as the mining booms ended, as we're having a um, bigger and bigger proportion of our population being above retirement age, it means that if aggregate supply side policies are not implemented well, future rates of economic growth will be limited and living standards are likely to fall. And we don't want that. 
So it's really, really important that we put things in place to try and stimulate aggregate supply and increase aggregate supply so that we don't fall into a part, um, situation where we're not being more productive, we're being stagnant, and we're not able to supply more despite needing to supply more overall. So in general terms, trying to increase aggregate supply or productive capacity occurs whenever we improve the quantity and or quality of our resources used in production. So essentially, we want to improve productivity to increase production. So we want to become more productive by either using or finding high quality resources or making our labor resources um, more effective, or we are wanting to use productive resources that are going to allow us to create a larger quantity of production. So for example, one policy, like we could implement, um, well, one example that we're gonna talk about later on in the third lesson is about improving infrastructure as an aggregate supply side policy. So the fact that when the government spends billions of dollars on roads or trying to get rid of level crossings, which they're doing at the moment, this allows us a higher rate of efficiency because travel times are decreased, then people are able to be more productive and improves living standards because of that. And if we are more productive, hopefully that means production will also increase, therefore improving aggregate supply overall. So the, improving the quantity or quality of our resources used in production. So education and training often improves the quality of our resources used in production because all of a sudden your workers have more skills and therefore they can do their job better. Uh, an example of it for this morning, um, at school, they've started doing temperature checks when students arrive. New staff needed to be trained on how to do temperature checks properly in the morning. And therefore, they are being upskilled. Therefore, they are better able to do their job, which apparently includes doing temperature checks for students now. Um, and that allows a more productive workplace because hopefully by temperature checking for students, we won't be shut down and therefore production won't be stopped. So um, to make a very, very strong um, hint and point. Um, examiners, teachers, economics people in general love to make questions about production versus productivity. In fact, they're not the same thing, but often students confuse them as the same thing. And it's really, really important to know the difference between the two of them. They may set, look kind of similar in how they are spelt, but they are different things. Um, production is simply a measure of the total level of goods and services produced. Whereas productivity is the rate at which we turn our inputs into outputs or the outputs per unit of input. So increasing production doesn't necessarily mean you're being more productive, but increasing productivity should increase your production overall. So when we're talking about aggregate supply, most often we're talking about improving productivity first and hopefully leading back to an improvement in production. So making sure you never confuse those two. Production is the final product of the total amount that has been produced, whereas productivity is how you go about doing that, how effective you are at doing that. So productivity is the rate at which you turn your inputs into outputs and how well you're doing that. Production is those outputs, the total value of them, the total amount of them, that is your production. So make sure you do not get those confused. You know, it's guaranteed, like if you were in my class, there will probably be a distinguished question about production and productivity on the SAC or practice SAC because I'm a monster and I like to do these kind of things if I put a hint out because when people get it wrong when I put a hint out, I like to feel a little bit like, like really, I just get annoyed. No one wins, nobody wins, don't do it, get it right. The information's there. Then lastly, we're gonna talk about, um, well not lastly, second lastly, um, by seeking improved aggregate supply, we're trying to achieve the different types of efficiency. So you can be efficient in a number of different ways based on um, the different ways in which you are implementing aggregate supply side policies and ties back in with the efficiencies we looked at earlier in the year in area 31. So um, you've got technical or productive efficiency, which involves uh, maximum output at the least cost. So if a business is trying to imp like improve their technical or productive efficiency, they might replace workers with technology because that means they're gonna be more productive and be able to get more output and pay less wages. You've got intertemporal efficiency, which is balancing the nation's resources between current future use, so that's about like when the government's doing their spending. They don't spend all of like the nation's capital at once. They space it out over time and try and do things over time. Like they might give funding a little bit over time because they want to make sure that it's sustainable and that improvements are occurring. 
the reason why we don't just use all of our iron, export all of our iron all straight away. We've got to use it slowly over time. We don't cut down all of the trees because we need trees for oxygen. So we manage how many, how much deforestation or how much logging occurs so that the trees can regrow before we have to do it again. And then lastly, dynamic efficiency, which is going to be incredibly important this year. Um, how quickly firms and industries are able to respond to changing market conditions. This one's massive right now based on the pandemic. So an example of that currently would be um, the pandemic um, changed how people go about dining in restaurants. So um, restaurants um, that would normally be eating have now gone to taking online takeaway orders when eating in at restaurants is banned. So this means that they're able to continue being productive despite the changing conditions. So an example of this, um, where I live, there was a very, very nice um, like pub slash restaurant called The Plow, and they serve very like fancy kind of food. And normally it would just be only eat in, but they transitioned to being online orders and doing takeaways and doing deliveries because they needed to keep maintaining business during this time and were able to like maintain a large percentage of their business by shifting to that online infrastructure. That's an example of being dynamically efficient because they weren't doing that before, but market conditions changed and they had to change and line up with that. Lastly, is about our international competitiveness. So if we are getting more efficient and we are uh, implementing agri supply side policies well, it means that we are going to be more competitive against our trading partners and therefore be able to hopefully have the goal of increasing our global market share. So ideally we'd like Australian firms to produce at a low enough price or high enough quality that we have an advantage over our overseas competition. So part of the reason we're often not very internationally competitive is the high cost of wages in Australia. So some aggregate supply side policies like if we're becoming more technically efficient, so we're implementing more technology or we're becoming more efficient in other ways, allows us to become more internationally competitive. And if we become more internationally competitive, it means there's going to be more demand for our overall output and we're able to keep that aggregate supply increasing overall. So to summarise what we've talked about in this previous 12 minutes, aggregate supply side policies are all about increasing our productivity, efficiency and overall productive capacity. The amount of the types of policies that are going to be used for that we are going to go through at a later date. All you need to know currently is that the difference between production and productivity, so productivity being the amount of outputs per unit of input, and production being the total overall um, outputs produced. And then also that um, we want to increase aggregate supply, which is moving the aggregate supply curve to the right. And then specifically the different types of efficiency and how they can be implemented and potentially some examples of them. So I hope this was useful for you. If you have any questions at all, send me an email. My email is listed below. And um, on that, I hope you have an excellent day and I will see you next time for how aggregate supply side policies can impact each of the three domestic macroeconomic goals. Have a great day. I'll see you next time. Bye.